Welcome to the Holistic Psychiatry Podcast. I'm Courtney Snyder, a physician and holistic adult and child psychiatrist. In this episode, I'll be talking about RCCX theory, hypermobility, mental health, and complex chronic illness. So hypermobility, which can be flexibility, being particularly flexible or double-jointed, is a surprisingly common trait in those with brain symptoms. Using RCCX theory, I'll explain why this may be the case. RCCX is a gene module or cluster of genes that appear to be at the foundation of many psychiatric conditions and complex chronic health conditions, such as mast cell activation, chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic inflammatory response syndrome that we see with mold and Lyme, and POTS or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. This topic is complex but worth the effort. Though hypermobility can be a red flag for an RCCX vulnerability, this theory can inform us about brain symptoms whether we are hypermobile or not. I won't be sharing my personal journey, which I did in 2017, in a blog post titled Hypermobility, RCCX Theory, and One Journey from Illness Towards Wholeness. So this is on my website and I'll put a link in the description below. If you've followed my writing, you likely noticed I've been impacted by many things. Undermethylation with a seemingly slow MAOA, copper overload, mast cell activation, candida, mold toxicity, hypermobility with upper cervical instability, electromagnetic hypersensitivity, and those are just the ones that I've talked about. But there are many people with what we call complex chronic illness. One of those to whom I'm especially grateful is Dr. Sharon McGlathery. She's a physician, psychiatrist, and internist with a health history very similar to my own. We first connected in 2017. Her RCCX theory not only explains chronic complex illness, but also chronic psychiatric conditions in individuals with or without hypermobility. This theory is especially good at explaining what happens to a person who is going along just fine in life until they are hit with a severe or multiple stressors or a toxic exposure, which sets them into a range of health issues, including brain symptoms. Because hypermobility appears to be an important red flag for some, I'll start there with my 10 points and move on to RCCX theory. So number one, connective tissue. This is what holds us together, not just our joints, but our skin, our blood vessels, and our organs, including our gastrointestinal tract. Relatively weak connective tissue can look different in different people and to varying degrees. Examples include having double-jointed knees, elbows, wrists, and or fingers. It can also be dislocations, flat feet, misalignment of the spine, hernias, prolapses at the pelvic floor, osteoporosis, stretchy and or translucent skin, poor wound healing, stretch marks, varicose veins, low blood pressure from weak blood vessels, hemorrhoids, aneurysms, a permeable gut blood barrier, problems with motility, so movement of the GI tract, diverticuli, and mitral valve prolapse, and there are more. Number two, TNXB. This is the name of a gene that codes for tenaskin, a protein involved in collagen architecture. A mutation here can impact our connective tissue to varying degrees, from none all the way to Ehlers-Danlos or EDS, a group of 13 inherited conditions that affect connective tissue. You may have always been more flexible than most without stretching. You may have gravitated towards gymnastics or dance because of this. You may or may not have a few of the connective tissue symptoms that I mentioned. You may just have double-jointed fingers. Maybe you have family members who fall on the hypermobility spectrum, but don't yourself. This family history is relevant here as well. There are other factors, such as progesterone, which can further loosen connective tissue. Number three. Can hypermobility alone cause brain symptoms? As described in a recent episode 
on upper cervical instability in the atlas, hypermobility contributing to upper cervical instability, which impacts the vagus, the flow of blood and cerebral spinal fluid in and out of the brain and skull. These can affect the functioning of the brain. Also, a permeable gut-blood barrier can cause leaky gut, meaning food particles or toxins can get through more easily, causing immune activation, impacting the brain. Low blood pressure from blood pooling in the legs can result in less blood flow making its way to the brain. Even this can trigger a stress response. Decreased gut motility can lead to constipation and or SIBO, both of which can impact brain health. Even with all of this, hypermobility does not appear to be the main driver when it comes to chronic health conditions for many. Number four, EDS, MCAS, and POTS, a common triad. It is increasingly recognized that Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, EDS, mast cell activation syndrome, MCAS, and postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS, frequently occur together. It is recognized, too, that many, if not most, with this triad have brain-related symptoms and psychiatric diagnoses. So we talked about EDS as far as connective tissue, but mast cell activation relates to mast cells, which are first responders in the inflammatory response. Those with mast cell activation syndrome have wide-ranging and unpredictable symptoms that occur when mast cells destabilize and release inflammatory mediators. Though not in the brain, they communicate with inflammatory cells in the brain and can trigger brain inflammation. POTS, the other term that I mentioned, or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, occurs when your heart rate increases very quickly after getting up from lying down or sitting. Symptoms include lightheadedness, fainting, and rapid heartbeat, which are relieved by lying down again. Many people I see don't have full-blown EDS, MCAS, or even POTS, but have a touch of all or some of these along with brain-related symptoms. So again, you can think of all of these on a spectrum. Number five, what is unifying EDS, MCAS, POTS, and psychiatric conditions and the various spectrums of these? There are different theories. One is that mast cells are at the root of all of this, and are leading to connective tissue symptoms in those with genetic vulnerabilities. Another theory is that these are all connected to faulty methylation. But the theory that has made the most sense to me over the years, for myself and for many people I see, has been RCCX theory. Number six, RCCX. RCCX itself is not a theory. It is the name of an identified gene module that the theory is based on. RCCX is basically a cluster of four genes that are inherited together. Normally, our genes are not inherited together like this. Not only is this unusual, it's a big deal because three of these genes are powerhouses when it comes to our health. Two of the three genes have a high rate of mutations. A mutation in various places on these genes not yet able to be tested for because it could be in many different places weakening the gene, can impact the functioning of the enzyme that the gene codes for. The main genes and what they code for include the first TNXB, which I mentioned codes for a protein involved in collagen architecture. The second gene, however, is called CYP21A2 which may be one of the biggest players when it comes to psychiatric conditions. It codes for the enzyme 21-hydroxylase, a pivotal enzyme in hormone pathways. Number three, C4 codes for complement C4, a protein involved in the immune response. A mutation here could result in autoimmunity and even schizophrenia. Number seven, RCCX3. According to Dr. McLathery's theory, this, quote, co-inheritance of a cluster of highly mutable genes may confer vulnerability to familial clusters of overlapping syndromes of chronic illness. So again, hypermobility, autoimmune disease, chronic fatigue, 
MCAS, POT, and psychiatric illness, unquote. To see the extensive list, because it's too long for me to include here, you can visit the RCCX website. There's a great deal of information, but there's a long list of conditions associated with RCCX, many of which we'll see in individuals, but even more so when looking at their family history. That these genes are inherited as a block, as opposed to being inherited separately, doesn't mean a mutation in one gene causes a mutation in the others. There does, however, seem to be a high rate of co-inheritance of mutations in two of the genes. The first, the gene that relates to hypermobility, and the second, the gene that relates to impaired hormonal stress response. This stress response can result in chronic physical or mental illness due to mast cell activation, which it triggers, and I'll explain this shortly. Seemingly 15% of the population appear to be impacted. While the symptoms and conditions can occur in one person and or sporadically throughout families with this RCCX gene cluster, women are usually impacted the most. One person, for example myself or Dr. McLathery, in a family can be hit the hardest. I do suspect that those of us with a slow COMT and MAOA, which would convey a slower clearing of dopamine and norepinephrine, are more likely to put excessive demand on that 21 hydroxylase until our body can't meet the demand for cortisol because of the weak gene. Number eight, wired for danger. The impact of 21 hydroxylase on the stress response starts early. To quote Dr. McLathery, I posit that a child carrying a CYP21A2 mutation has the same brain as a child raised in adverse circumstances, unquote. She goes on to describe structural differences in the brain, including enlarged limbic structures, specifically the amygdala. In utero and infancy, the brain of someone with this gene mutation is essentially wired for danger, not unlike someone with PTSD. This decreased ability to deal with stress, according to Dr. McLathery, raises one's susceptibility to PTSD or other forms of disordered emotional processing. RCCX theory suggests that about 15 to 20 percent of us have a mutation on 21 hydroxylase. Decreased cortisol levels, which can occur from severe, acute, or chronic high stress, can lead the brain to release more corticotropin-releasing hormone, or CRH. This is a hormone that tells the adrenal glands to make more cortisol. This increase in CRH, or corticotropin-releasing hormone, leads us to number nine, the inflammation connection. The kicker here is that mast cells have receptors for CRH. So when stress is high, that weak 21 hydroxylase pathway becomes overwhelmed and not enough cortisol is being produced. Inflammation, including brain inflammation, then follow. This overwhelm of 21 hydroxylase can result in mast cell activation, POTS, and chronic fatigue syndrome. It can also cause chronic inflammatory and or biotoxin illness. Associated psychiatric issues cover the full range from panic, anxiety, OCD, depression, bipolar disorder, ADHD, hyperfocus, autism, sensory processing, and psychosis. For an RCCX person, an exposure to mold, for example, can lead to symptoms not just from the mold, but from the consequences of the 21 hydroxylase getting overwhelmed, leading to inflammation, including brain inflammation. Those without RCCX, on the other hand, will mainly have symptoms of mold toxicity. Seemingly, only one copy of this gene for the 21 hydroxylase, meaning from one parent, is necessary for someone to be vulnerable to medical or psychiatric illness after severe acute or prolonged stress. Number 10, hypermobility as a red flag. Because of RCCX theory, hypermobility becomes a big clue as to what's going on and what tools may be helpful. Recognizing it can be an especially important marker for physicians and other practitioners to consider when meeting anyone 
seeking help for chronic medical or psychiatric conditions. For those of us who are not ill, this symptom or trait may suggest a vulnerability to becoming ill physically and or mentally after acute or chronic stress. As complex as it is, I do believe this understanding of RCCX theory can move people more quickly to a diagnosis, assist in more effective targeted treatments, and help those in treatment recognize their vulnerabilities and adjust their lifestyle choices accordingly. Had I known about RCCX theory, I may have actually changed my life sooner. I may have welcomed a good reason to take better care of myself. I might have taken the phrase daily stress more seriously. Getting sick forced me to simplify every aspect of my life. Out of necessity, I'd lost energy for and could no longer tolerate things like television, stuff, ego-driven aspirations. I let go of relationships and activities that were no longer meaningful for me. As I healed, I started adding in what I loved. I built a spiritual practice that reminded me that I control very little in this world, that there is meaning in our suffering, and that I'm part of something larger than myself, that I'm here for a purpose. These lifestyle changes and my spiritual growth helped me shut off my acute stress response, which was making me sick, along with mold toxicity. And according to Dr. McLathery, quote, If you can figure out how to do that, then the whole cycle of elevated CRH, inflammatory cascade, mast cell activation, and elevated progesterone decreases, not gone, but lessens, unquote. Though I'm of the belief that there are many paths to lowering the stress response, Dr. McLathery finds EMDR to be especially helpful. Thank you for sticking with me on this one. If you would like to get the text and audio to these episodes in your mailbox each week, please consider subscribing at CourtneySnyderMD.com or on Substack. Until next time, take care.